Awesome. Well, yeah. And uh, so it's it's exciting to be in another NodeConf one shot. Uh, we started doing these uh, last year, and and the idea is that like anybody in this audience can go and run one of these if you have like a little bit of kind of organizer skills and, and budgeting a little bit. If you know how to open a spreadsheet, and uh, if you've maybe run a meetup, you can just up your fucking game and do like a whole day long conference. And we have like a wiki page that has lots of tips and tricks, and hopefully you'll update it with like a bunch of more information about like how to do them better now that you're doing a bunch of them. Um, so yeah, you know, when you go back to wherever city you're in, you're like, maybe we should have a day long conference here about node stuff. Uh, you know, that's the idea. Uh, just go to the one shot GitHub org and we'll get you sorted. All right, so this is the first question that I got um, from Rod Vag. Well, this wasn't, they're not in the order that I got them, they're in the order that makes sense for explaining things. But this one is, uh, so is, the fa is this whole foundation thing really just a strategy for me to shut down the node mailing lists? <laughs> Um, so obviously, the, so the foundation in IOJS are much more than just me. It's a really big community. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of motivations in that community. I can't speak to everybody's motivations, but my motivation is primarily to shut down the node mailing list. <laughs> um, it's a cesspool, and it should die in a fire. Um, all right. So how much of a strain has the fork put on the relationship between community members? So. This is an interesting question, because I think that um, a lot of people's perception is that there's like a lot of conflict um, because of the fork. And the reality is that, that there was a lot more conflict around core and around the people that worked in core before the fork. Because before the fork, everybody was fighting to get stuff in and fighting to make these changes happen. And then as soon as we had this fork to go off and work on, everybody was very content just getting their stuff done. Um, and a lot of the conflict actually lowered around core issues um, and it was only sort of after things really took off and we were doing really well that there was a bit more conflict with like the the older project because they were like now kind of mad that we had done this fork um, and then I think in the beginning, we had almost universal positivity about the fork. Um, people were really sick of the rate of change in, in Node. So there was a lot of optimism and a lot of people really happy. Once we started to do really well, once there were all of these releases and all this stuff, and it was like, oh my god, you're really succeeding, and we don't see a path yet for you merging back together, then people got really uneasy, because they were like, OK, well, which, which one of these am I going to have to support? Like, Are they going to diverge at some point in time? Like. Um, so w there was actually a lot more kind of turmoil in the user community after we started becoming successful because now it's like, oh, oh shit, like now I have to care about these two things potentially. Um, and we, we noticed, you know, when we, the closer that we got to potentially coming into the foundation and merging the projects together and, and eventually made that decision, um, there was just this big sigh of relief from the user community that we're just like, oh, okay, all right, this is going to work out now. I don't have to worry about these two forks anymore. Um, but, you know, there wasn't too much strain before that. Or if there was strain, it was sort of below the surface, which is nice. I don't know. What's the, what's that? It's the, it's the radio waves. Oh, uh, maybe. Maybe. Here, just give me, just give me that base pack. This guy. And then you're going to need to switch out the Which channel is it? There it is. It's that channel. And it's not all fuzzy now. Yep. Professional. All right. Uh, so that's the answer to that question. So uh, when, when you see IOJS only modules, do you think it's cool or that people are missing the point? So I've only seen like four IOJS only modules, right? Like there's not that many differences. Uh, it's really hard to write an IOJS only module. Um, the main, oh, the static is back. Awesome. Uh, it's, it's pretty hard to write an IOJS only module. Like, you've got to really try. Um, I think the, the one big one that everybody likes is, whoa, what the fuck? <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. All right. Okay. I am the audio visual QA for the evening. Um, okay. So 
IOJS only modules. Um, yeah, I mean, the whole point of IOJS is that it supports every module that's ever been written before. Um, but obviously, you know, if, if we, the fork was going to continue for a long time, if we didn't end up merging back together, uh, we would want reasons for people to come over and start using the new stuff. So there will be features, which means the newer modules can introduce forward and compatibilities. This is something that we always knew was going to, to happen and there was always a possibility. And it, it was one of the points, you know, if you were doing it with good reason. The big one everybody talks about is the, the JS DOM one, um, because that's a big module that a lot of people use. And also, Dominic was kind of a dick about it um, when he put it in there. Uh, like, <laughs> he referred to Node.js as legacy. Um, <laughs> it, was, it, was not, it was not in, in the best taste. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, and th but that he, did, he didn't move it with a good reason. Um, there were some changes that he actually got into the VM module that were specifically needed for JS DOM. And then we released those and Node didn't. And uh, so he was like, you know what? I'm, I'm not going to continue to support that old stuff. Like, this is going to make my life a whole lot easier. Um, there haven't been a lot of other IOJS only modules, right? So like the, the thing about taking on the new ES6 features is that we get to test them and we get to play with them. But um, for the most part, people are still using transpilers because they want all of the ES6 features. Or the, and they might want a couple more features that we don't have yet from ES7 or whatever. So even you know, people that are doing a ton of stuff with promises, they're, they're messing around with promises natively in, in IOJS. But for, for the most part, when they publish the modules, they're just going through a transpiler. Um, so there's not a lot of them. So uh, I, yeah, when I see them, I'm like, oh, cool. You're using new features. Awesome. All right. How frequent will releases be, and will there be an LTS version? Yes. Um, OK, so releases are going to be about as frequent as they've been in IOJS. So if you, if you don't know, we're merging back together. And um, the next version of Node.js is based on the current IOJS master. Um, so our rate of change and our release process is basically going to drive whatever the next version of Node is and all the versions subsequently after that. And the strategy there is that we, we don't actually we don't have time-based releases. What we have is basically a threshold for the number of changes that we want to see per release. So if there's a lot of changes going in, we might do a release every day. And if there's not that many changes going in, we might do one every other week. The, the main thing that we want is we want the delta between one uh, current version and the next current version to be very, very small, because it makes it a lot easier to track down bugs and issues in, in the community that way. Um, for prior major release lines, like what you would want LTS releases for, those we, it sounds like we are going to do time-based, and we're going to figure out what the best time frame for that is. Is it, is it three months? Is it six months? Like, how do we stagger these together? But essentially, what, we, what we're going to do is we're going to go, OK, what are all the bug fixes that have come in and all of the small features that we know have been really well tested in the, in the current line? Let's backport all of those into one big LTS release for prior lines. Um, the, probably the most noticeable thing that you'll get very, very soon out of this is that you'll actually get an 0.10 bug fix release, which is probably very useful since almost everybody is still on 0.10 if you look at the actual data numbers, right? And we'll also get some, some more, like, line, we'll get far more bug fix releases out of, like, 0.12 as well. Um, and then going forward, as we introduce more new majors, we'll see those as well. OK, tell us more about LTS. OK. Um, and uh, you're concerned about API stability, then bug fixes. All right, OK. So OK. There are two branches that you need to care about um, in, uh, right now in IOJS and eventually uh, Node.js slash Node on GitHub, like the main line for all Node.js, will follow the same pattern. Uh, there's master and next. So master is the current release line. So right now in IOJS, that's 2.x. So every release that we do is 2.x. So every change that goes into master is either a patch update or a minor update. So it can, you can add API, and you can fix bugs. You can't break API. You can't deprecate anything. You can't change anything. You can't uh, change the ABI, like the, the native stuff for native modules. So uh, taking an update of, a major, of any major line will not force you to recompile all of your add-ons. Um, 
So that's how master works. Anything that will break the ABI, like a new version of V8, uh, any changes, any uh, like reverse incompatible changes or changes to API, and we really rarely do those, and they're usually really small, but they do happen. Um, those all go into the next branch. And so we're going to start doing uh, nightly releases of the next branch so that you can check out like the next version of V8 and the next set of breaking changes. But that's essentially going to be the next major release. All right, so every time that the next line gets stable, which is usually means that the V8 in it gets stable, like it goes out in a version of Chrome, and we know that that version is stable, and we're comfortable with the changes that are in the next branch, we'll do a new major release, right? And when we do that, the old major release line now goes into the LTS cycle. So releases on that one get much slower, just bug fixes. Um, so if you, if you like have a production server and you really don't want to be on like, you don't want to be updating every week for all the newest stuff. You just want like you know the bug fixes and things that come down. You want like a bit more of a notion of stability. You'd probably just stick with the previous major release line, um, and then you and then you're very very confident that you're not going to break API. You're not going to break any of the native compatibility stuff. Now there is a big like asterisk next to all these policies, which is that for security reasons, we might break any of these rules. Um, so if there's like a security problem that changes the ABI, guess what? Like we're breaking the ABI for fucking everybody back to the beginning of time. Um, and there's just, there's no way around it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, you, just, you have to, I'm sorry. Uh, but you know, there's, um, we're looking at better ways of doing this and, and better ways to get around sort of breaking everything. So like we, we, we had a we had a, a security issue in the cipher indexes, right? And and so that meant that we ended up breaking the ABI for all of like anybody who's doing uh, open SSL bindings and some other stuff. So that really sucked. And so now uh, like James Snell is working on some code that takes the ciphers in as part of the build step so that uh, if we ever want to change them out again, we don't have to break all of the, the ABI for everybody and break that whole layer again. So we're getting smarter about this over time. Uh, that's the good news. Um, all right. So with the Chakra announcement and IOJS fork, are we bringing browser panes to the back end, or is this good progress? So I mean, IOJS is merging back with Node, so we don't have weird compatibility issues between IOJS and Node now, right? Like IOJS community is sort of taking over running Node. Um, did everybody see the Chakra announcement? Do people know what it's talking about? Okay, so basically, some very smart people at Microsoft. Um, when, and um, they have like a little, like to call it a fork is a little bit sensational. Like it's like a GitHub fork, like when you just go and make some changes. Um, but they, they have uh, basically like a little branch with uh, where they swap out V8 for Chakra, which is, it's actually like the next version of Chakra. It's not even the current one. And Chakra is the uh, JavaScript VM that is in Edge browser, because it's not IE anymore, because everybody hates IE. So we'll just change the name and nobody will. <laughs> Oh, um, but uh, <laughs> Chakra is Chakra is in the next the next Edge browser, and Chakra is a really badass VM. Actually, um, it's I mean the performance wise is phenomenal. Uh, so we've been wanting to see something like this forever. I can't wait until GitHub slash Microsoft slash Chakra is up and it's actually open source because there's literally no competitive advantage to it being proprietary. Um, but yeah, so uh, this is really interesting because we've we've been talking about you know binding to Spider Monkey or binding to something else for a while. Wow. And it always seemed like this Herculean task because we, we thought that we would have to basically, you know, break out this, you know, create this huge abstraction layer where we bind to the VM and, and take on all this stuff. But if you look at the changes that the Chakra team made, they're really minor. Like the changes that happened in Node were really, really small. Um, and so we, the, the core team is really already talking about taking some of this code into the main line so that there isn't a fork um, of it anymore. And this is good for, for a couple reasons. One is that um, right now, every time that V8 updates their API, their internal API, we break like all the native add-ons. Like everybody who writes robots like has to go and fucking recompile. And and it's it's not just that you have to recompile. It's that um, everybody who uses uh, 
who, who uses like NAN or any of the native stuff, they have to go and update to the newest version of NAN. They have to publish a new version. Then everybody who relies on them has to publish a new version, and everybody who relies on them. And if you look at your NPM depth chain, it's fucking huge. And that's that takes like a year. Um, so the more that we get out of that cycle, the better. So at, at some point in time, we want we want to be at the point where Node owns that entire native layer, and we don't break it so often, um, and we don't have like this this huge problem of updating all these native dependencies. <coughs> one like one of the things that's going to help us get there quicker is supporting multiple VMs because now we're already starting to abstract out this layer, um, and we have a really good use case for like why and how to abstract it in different ways. Um, so yeah, I, I I actually don't think that uh, the Chakra stuff and the IOGIS stuff is is actually bringing us to a place where we have all these weird compatibility nightmares. It's, it's actually pushing us to a place where we have less compatibility nightmares inside of the Node ecosystem. Because um, if you figure this out correctly, um, you actually solve compatibility problems rather than introduce them. OK. Uh, what are the plans for shielding native modules from frequent <laughs> ABI and API changes? So uh, there, th this story is a little bit longer than, than what I was just getting into, but um, uh, so TJ, b before he stopped doing Node stuff, um, he, one of the things that he wanted to do was abstract the like entire, like everything that touches V8, he wanted to abstract and create like this Node.c file, and everybody would bind to this Node.c file. Um, the way that he approached that problem was to kind of boil the ocean a little bit, and he, he had this huge project um, where he was he was trying to do like this giant API, and then um, and and the other problem with that is that. It's only really helpful if you get it perfect the first time and never change it. Because as soon as you change it, like, oh, you just broke everybody's modules again. What the fuck was the point of doing this huge project? So I mean, it turns out to, to do that is like impossible. Um, and what ended up winning out was that like in the meantime, Rod Vag wrote this little library called NAN, worst name ever, um, called NAN. Uh, stands for Native Abstractions for Node, not, not a number, which is what we have in JavaScript. Thank you, Rod. Uh, um, but um, but Nan, he, he basically wrote Nan because he had two modules that were both native bindings, and he was really sick of maintaining both of them uh, in, in like this native binding land. So he wrote enough of a binding layer uh, abstraction between him and V8 that both of his modules would work, and that it was easier to support multiple versions of V8. And then what happened is that that just kind of grew to incorporate more use cases as more modules came along. So now Node Serial Port is on it. Um, and most of the modules that you use that are native have now moved to NAN. Uh, one, one reason is to make this whole upgrading process a little bit easier. Um, and two, it's just gotten better and better over time. So um, a couple months ago, uh, way before the merge, NAN uh, came into the IOJS org, um, got sort of semi-officially blessed. And there's now a working group that's not just about NAN, but also about like how do we solve this this whole native problem? And NAN is like a part of that solution. Um, so you know, NAN is NAN is getting better, but also we need to start moving core to a place where this gets abstracted a bit more. So so basically, NAN and the stuff that we're doing around like Chakra uh, support and and abstracting the the VM layer, they're they're sort of coming at this problem from two different ends. And and as we get closer and closer to reaching in the middle, a lot of these compatibility problems are going to get easier and easier over time. Um, additionally, the V8 team is aware of the fact that like, it's really annoying when they change their ABI for us. Um, and they're more cognizant of it now than they were before. And not in this current V8 line, but maybe in, in future V8 lines, they may be a little bit more deliberate about their ABI breaks uh, rather than just being like, eh, whatever. Like, you're going to get a new Chrome anyway. You're not going to notice, but like we notice. So. All right. Am I worried that IOJS might need to give up any part of its newfound vibrancy to be part of the foundation? Why says why not? So is this like the this is sort of the like uh, like you guys were like this awesome punk rock thing and now you're like this pop punk thing and it's fucking bullshit and you guys sold out. Um, <laughs> no, uh, so like. You know, back in the day, I, I wrote this up in an article uh, called Growing Up, but like way back in the day, 
um, you know, Joyent owned Node, but we all felt like we owned Node and everything was kind of working and we felt like as a community we were running the project. And then a few years later we realized that like, hey, we don't own it. Uh, and that really became a problem and we ended up having to do this fork and da da da. And so, um, IOJS like is this community and is this community led thing, but the actual individual assets can't be owned by this abstract entity called the community. Um, they're, so they're, they end up being owned by individuals and companies. Um, and if we continue to be wildly successful, like they could be exploited in the future. And it's really important that we put those into a neutral organization that can own property like a foundation. So we were gonna need to do a foundation anyway. We needed to do that. Um, there happened to be one already set up uh, called the Node Foundation that was like already going. And as an added bonus, we like get to merge back with Node and end this confusion. Also like, we're all part of the same community. Like IOJS and Node.js are part of the same community. Like we're building for the same people that write modules, the same user community. Um, you know, there are some advantages to competing, but there's also some huge disadvantages. I mean, like, it's not advantageous for our community for Node to die on the vine, for like releases of 0.10 to stop. Um, that's not actually good for our community. So if, the real question is like, if can we take all, like, most of this momentum, if not more, and try to bring it into some of the problems that the broader community has, like how do we get some new 0.10 releases out, and how do we speed up the rest of the process, and how do we fix all these other bigger, higher level problems? Um, and on, I think long term, we're actually going to be a lot stronger, and we're going to have a lot of new vibrancy. Uh, you know, we may have to do some stuff like, you know, like update the design on the website to get everybody excited again or something, but. Um, I don't know, uh, but yeah, you know, this is something that like I'm slightly worried about, but like I'm gonna try to solve as much as I can. Um, and I think a lot of us are are making sure that the progress that we've made in IOJS is preserved in the foundation. What will happen to IOJS after the Node IOJS merge? So uh, the answer to this is something, uh, and I don't know. But the so all of the IOJS assets are in the foundation now. Um, like we're you know we're we're migrating them to the foundation in some form. Um, there we we have them around. We might as well do something with them. You know, like we have this Twitter account with like you know ten thousand followers. Uh, you know, we have. Like this website that people go to, it's, you know, we should do something cool with it. I don't know what yet, but we'll do something rad. Um, I think if we try to do something too soon, we're going to end up doing something really confusing. Like people aren't going to get that we merge back together. So uh, we're sort of like putting it on hold, like what we do with the IOJS name until later. Um, but yeah, we'll do something. It'll be cool. Uh, okay. How would you recommend newcomers to uh, approach contributing to IOJS slash Node Foundation if you're just a regular Node.js dev? Oh, there's so many ways. So hopefully the new Node.js.org, uh, new and improved once we like move everything over, uh, will address this and will give you like all of the entry points for you to contribute to the community. But in IOJS, we, we already found that uh, creating these like autonomous working groups that handle certain problems made a lot of the project much more accessible. Accessible. So, um, if you speak in a non-English language and you want to get involved in translations or you just even like local meetups and community stuff in that side of that native language, um, there's like a repo and a team that's working on that that you can get involved in. Um, if you write websites, we have a website working group that has more than enough work for everybody to handle, so you can just hop in there and start doing stuff. Um, we have like an evangelism working group where we just kind of like try to promote the project and, and get out like nice weekly updates and keep the community like engaged and informed. Um, you know, it, it really depends on what you're interested. If you're interested in tracing, there's a tracing working group to get involved in. You know, if you're interested in streams, there's a streams working group that maintains the stream implementation. Um, we don't have this giant funnel into core anymore because that's just totally unsustainable. Um, and there's just not enough people that you can get into that funnel. So the, the sort of like, you know, quote unquote node core tasks are getting smaller and smaller as we break off all of these things into these working groups that are just far more accessible and easier to get involved in. 
So whichever part of Node that you're interested in, there's probably a working group for it. And if there's not, just start sending patches, and then if there's enough people that are working on it and not other stuff, we'll just create a working group for it. Um, so that that's sort of the answer there. It really depends on like what your skill set is and what you're sort of comfortable getting involved in. But we've tried to make every single one of these as accessible as possible. Oh, if you're into hardware and robots, there's now a brand new hardware working group as well that's uh, just kicking off. Oh, and then there's there's three more like as of yesterday or something that are they're just getting started. They haven't had their first meeting yet, but there's one for postmortem debugging. There's one for internationalization, like the actual internationalization standard object inside of JavaScript that we bind to and use ICU for. Uh, and there's another one for something. Oh, for benchmarking, if you're really into graphs. Um, okay. Uh, are there plans to hire a full-time community manager for issues, PRs, coordinating contributors to the foundation? So. No plans like this have been made uh, because no plans about budget and spending money have been made at all. Um, they will be eventually. So the, w the way that this works is that we're like we're signing up members right now, uh, corporate members. Those corporate members give money, and then we know how much money that we have. And then the board gets together and sort of figures out like where are like the general areas that we should be spending this money. Um, and then we go and we figure out how to spend that money. And if the TSC and the core people in the community are like, this is a problem, please like fix this with some money, uh, we'll spend money to fix that. Uh, what I will say though is that when we, I mean it's been like about a year and a half now that we've been working to like try and fix Node in, in various ways um, and you know trying to get into a foundation. And at first it felt like all of the problems in the project, or at least like of the bulk of them, were these resourcing problems where like if we had some money, we would pay people to do this and people to do this. And as soon as we set up IOJS and started like breaking off working groups and getting more people involved and engaged, more than half of those problems just went away um, just from contributors, right? So like some of these problems, like, like why is it hard for contributors to get involved doing that? And can we fix that first off? Um, and if we can't, and it really is a resource problem. Now we also have this venue to collaborate with a bunch of companies that are throwing money at Node independently of the foundation. So like all of the members of the foundation also have a bunch of people on their payroll and honestly have a bunch of really smart people just standing around half of the time. Um, and if you go, oh, we really have a problem with documentation, they'll be like, oh my god, we have like all these board documentation writers just sitting around like in some corner of IBM. Like can, we'll just we'll point them at that. Don't spend foundation money on that. Like that kind of thing happens all the time. Like we have a really engaged internationalization community, but we were talking about like, well, if we do error internationalization, um, like th it's really boring. <laughs> like it's just really boring to go through all the error messages and be like, oh, what is this? And like these other languages. Um, and and this somebody at IBM was like, oh no, there's just like a team of people that will do that. Uh, we'll we'll handle that. Don't worry about it. So. Um, you know, the first step is like, how do we fix this as a community? Can we get the community involved? Okay, we actually do need, say that we do need like a dedicated person full time. First, reach out to the donors, see if they're going to put it in. And if not, if all else fails, hire somebody from the foundation to actually solve this problem. So, big fat fucking maybe. Um, and that is my last question. And if I have a look, no, I don't have any more time. So I can't, you can't ask any questions. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, who's next?